Oh. All right, well, it's two minutes after 10, so we'll get started. I'm Diane Wells, the Deputy Director at the Office of Broadband Development, and I want to thank you for taking the time today to attend our live webinar. We are recording this so that it will be posted for others that weren't able to attend or if you want to go back and um, reacquaint yourself with something that was said. Um, or maybe review it in case you have questions prior to submitting a question to our office. But this is a, a webinar for our round nine grant program for both border to border and lower population density. I wanna welcome you again, and um, we'll go on to the next slide. Um, we have our team. Oh, we have Bree Mackey, our executive director first um, with an introduction. Well, welcome to Grand Round 9's webinar. We're ex so excited you are here. I'm Bree Mackey and I'm the Executive Director of the Office of Broadband Development. I'm sorry I can't be live with you on this webinar, but I have no doubt that my incredible team and the team at DEED will help walk you through all of the important information you need to know in order to participate in this Grant Round. We are really excited as Grant Round 9 is another investment in broadband across the state where many people still do not have the access they deserve and need to participate fully in the way they would like to in their communities. Right after I speak here, you're going to get a nice introduction from this incredible staff that really does work diligently to make sure that these programs and all the technical capacity and assistance in our office goes smoothly and works for all of you. We appreciate the partnership every day that all of you are making to ensure that broadband access across Minnesota is achievable. This webinar is really going to be helpful on highlighting, highlighting deadlines, mapping, new things that may have changed in the past grant rounds, and we're really here to provide any technical assistance we can be to all of you. Over the last year, we've awarded over $167 million in grant awards for border to border and low population programs. We look forward to this 50 million as well. Please be patient with us. You're going to learn very soon about our new grants portal that we're really excited to be able to bring to all of you in hopes that it makes all of our work a little bit easier and a little bit more streamlined. But as we know, these processes do take time and we do value your input and again, also your patience. So with that, thank you again for participating. We're really excited to see how all of this work and partnerships together really achieve the goals and really impact the lives of Minnesota. All right, well, thank you, Bree. And as you can see, we have our team live on the webinar today, and I'm going to just um, introduce them individually, and then they'll indicate um, how long they've been working for the office or the state and where they're located since we all work remotely. So Jen, we'll start with you. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Jen Frost. I'm a broadband grants administrator with the office since 2000. Um, I also like to call that round six, the round six year. So I'm excited to start my fourth round with the office today. Thanks, Jen. Carrie Jansen. Good morning, Carrie Jansen. I've been with the office since January of 2022. So this is actually my second full grant round, so this will be exciting. I live uh, by Olivia, Minnesota, which is in the southwest portion of the state. Thanks, Carrie. Mike? Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mike Wimmer, I'm a broadband grants administrator. I've been with the office since February of 2023, um, and I am based out of rural Morrison County. Thanks. Oh, Carol um, is with us. You may know her from her previous role helping out in the office, but she's taking on a new role in the grants area specifically. Carol? Hi, everyone. I'm Carol Basut, and I've been with the Office of Broadband Development since January of 2022. 
And I live in Cottonwood, Minnesota, which is about 15 miles north of Marshall, Minnesota, in the southwest part of the state. Welcome, everyone. Thanks, Carol. And our newest um, grant administrator is actually sitting with me here in St. Paul. I'm here onboarding her today. It's Michelle Repholtz. Michelle? Hi, uh, I'm Michelle Rubholtz. It's my first day at DEED. I have worked for the state for 22 years, um, starting off in telecom regulation, um, and I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Michelle. And then I should mention I also live north of Melrose, Minnesota, so we all are fairly remote with just a couple in the Twin Cities. And then last but not least, we have a GIS analyst on board now, Jared. Hi, Jared Haas. I'm a, a GIS analyst. I've been with OBD since mid-August, and uh, I live in St. Croix Falls, Wisconsin, just over the border. Thanks, Jared. I think our next slide, I should know this. Um, one of the biggest new features of round nine is we're going to be using a grants management system. So Anna Rodell, who is in charge of that system, is joining us. And what we'll do is if you have questions, please submit them in the chat or to the deed.broadband email box. And then um, for sure, get your questions in related to the grant management system while Anna is here. And when she's finished, we'll take questions for her. And then we will move on to the overview of the Office of Broadband and the grants program. So thank you, Anna. Thanks, Diane. Thanks all. Um, good morning. Welcome. We are using a new grants management system at DEED, and I'm going to walk you through um, the system itself and then some specifics regarding the applications for the lower density um, grant program as well as the border to border grant program. So let me share my screen and then jump in and just let me know when you can see that. We can this see OK, yeah, great. Um, so our grants management system at DEED doesn't have all of our grants currently at DEED. It's a newer system that we stood up um, in July of this year and will be slowly rolling on new grant programs as um, we get more of the system built out. Um, but we're excited to have this available for the grants um, for broadband currently. And um, the website is mndeedgrants.mn.gov. You'll also find links to that on our competitive grants and contracts page on the deed website, as well as um, in the RFP document itself for these grant pro programs. So I'm going to go and show you um, how to do registration in the system. We do ask that an organization representative and that role is deemed as someone who has contract signing authority with the state of Minnesota um, for contracts and grants, um, that that person be the initial person to register into the system. And then once that person gets registered and approved, sets up their um, company or organization profile in the system, you will then be able to add additional users yourselves to the system. Um, if you need to have multiple organization representatives in the system, so those are the people that would submit the application for um, the program that you're applying for. They would submit payment requests and amendment requests, anything like that. Um, we can add additional users, but you will not be able to add additional organization representatives yourselves, but you can reach out to us and we will add them for you. So the other two roles, um, that are applicable um, to external users such as yourselves are roles of organization member, um, which has all the permissions that an organization representative has except for the ability to submit an application. Um, and then also a grant writer. So if you are happen to be utilizing a grant writer um, that maybe is a contracted grant writer, um, that's a good um, role to assign that person just in case you don't need to have allow them to have access to everything um, in the grants management system. So when you go to mndgrants.mn.gov, um, you will find this login page. Um, just underneath the login button here, there is a new user registration link. And so when you click on that, there's going to be some required fields. All required fields in the system have a little asterisk in front of the field. Um, 
indicating that it's required. Um, so we'll ask you for your name, job title, organization or company, the address associated with that organization. I'll have you ask, create your own username and password. And then once you hit register, that registration comes to us and we do some validation. Um, we might reach out with some questions, just asking if you are definitely the organization representative for your company. Um, and then once you get approved, you will receive an email from us indicating that you are approved to go and log into the system. And um, I will walk you through how to do that setup of your profile. So I'm going to go into our demo site to provide um, some context for how to do that. So I'm going to log in as an organization representative. I've already been approved in the system. I'm going in and logging in. And once I log in, I will get to a dashboard. Prior to starting an application for a, a grant program, you'll need to set up your organization profile first. And by doing that, you select your name and then profile. And this will take you to your own personal profile as well as the profile of the organization that you're associated with. Um, so on the left side, um, consistently throughout the system, you'll see navigations to different forms that should be completed. This will be similar to the application process too, which I'll show you. Um, so if you ever need to change your password, if you've landed on your person information, that's your own personal profile for your user in the system, you can scroll all the way down to the bottom and do the edit password here um, where you'll be able to edit your password and submit. Um, if you ever get locked out of the system too, um, I just want to note that there is a forgot username password link on the home page um, that you land on. So if you ever need to reset either, um, you can do it that way. Um, we also have an email address that I'll put in chat a little bit later um, for any technical assistance name. Um, technical assistance questions that you may have regarding the system itself. Um, and that email address is gms.deed, D-E-E-D, at state.mn.us. And I'll put both the links for the system itself and the email address in the chat in a little bit. So as I mentioned, prior to starting an application, you'll need to complete your information for your organization or company's profile. The organization information, some of this you probably will have completed in the registration process initially on that initial pop up that you filled out, um, but you might want to add additional information if you have it. Um, the federal EIN number is here where you can add that and then UEI information as well. Um, and then business address should be completed on the initial registration form and then we'll go to organization members as the next piece. So this is where you can add any company or organization um, members to this organization profile in the system. And you'll do that by clicking this little plus sign over here under member search and select add new user to organization. Where you'll enter in first and last name, and then contact information, um, and then under assigned roles is, are those roles that I was talking about. Um, you'll be able to assign a grant writer, which has the lowest level of permissions, um, and then or an organization member, which has just a step up from the grant writer underneath the organization representative. Um, they're able to do a lot of things in the system, but they're not able to submit the application itself. Um, assigned to existing documents. If you want them to be assigned to anything that's currently in the system, um, any applications that you start, um, I would select yes. Um, I think yes is the best option to choose in this when you're doing initial setup, just so to make sure that they're assigned to everything that you used to initiate. And then you'll be able to apply a username and password for them. And as I mentioned, they can, um, edit their password once they log in on the first time by going to their user profile under their name. And then we have a couple of more forms that you'll need to complete. Organization categories. Um, this is a self-selection of what type of uh, categories apply to your organization or business. Um, so you'll be able to see the description of each and then select which one is applicable 
to your organization or business. Additional organization information is something that absolutely needs to be completed before you start your application. Um, and you'll see this at, without the check mark um, until it is completed and saved. Um, so you'll need to make sure that that check mark is there before you initiate the application. Um, the save buttons in the system in general are always in the upper right hand corner. Um, so just be aware of that location for save. Um, it will not automatically save for you on this form. You'll have to save it yourself to be able to retain this information. So we do ask that you, if you do have a doing business as for your company, um, that we you provide it here um, along with any remit address information. And as much as possible, this should reflect what you may have registered for SWIFT, if you're in the SWIFT system or um, finance system at the state. Um, this should mirror that same information that you have submitted to them. Um, we also require a state tax ID. Um, the org ID is just a system ID that just automatically gets applied, so you don't need to worry about that. It will just be filled in by the system. But we are also asking for your SWIFT ID and SWIFT under location ID if you have that. It's not required at this point, but um, if you can complete that section, that's very helpful for us. So once you've completed all of your organization information, you can go back to the home screen in the upper left. And this will allow you to land on your dashboard. There's a couple different buckets that you'll see on your dashboard when you come here. Um, there's an announcement section that we're currently not using in the system, but this is where we might have some general information about any um, bugs that we have in the system that we're trying to work on. So it's a good thing to pay attention to as you're using the system, just so if um, there are any known issues, we will have information about those here. The My Task is the part of the dashboard of tasks that are assigned to you once they're initiated. Um, and I'll, I'll refer back to that in just a little bit. But once you're ready to start your application, um, you'll find the opportunities that are available to you in your organization under the My Opportunities. So these are the grant programs that are currently in the system and available to you. Um, we do have the Border to Border B2B grant program, and then we have the Lower Density Population Development Grant Program as well. Um, so we will enter into the B2B. You'll get a pop up just having some general language about eligibility and the description of the program. Um, we do note that you're not you can only submit um, for the same project either with border to border or lower de um, density. Um, but you cannot submit um, the same project proposal for both at the same time. So in order to enter into the application, you'll hit agree. And that will bring you to this, what is called the document landing page, which is the initiation of your application in the system. There are, um, there is one thing that I want to point out, which is this identifier for your, your specific application that you've started. Um, that's in the upper left. Um, it indicates what kind of program it is, what year it is, the name of your organization, and then it gives you a number associated with that application. If you ever need to reach out for technical assistance and you're, you have multiple applications in the system, it's very helpful for us if you reference this number for us to understand which application you're talking about. So just a little note about that. Um, on the left side, you'll see the navigation through all the forms that um, are associated with the application itself. And I will walk through these. The first form that you'll come to is the RFP information form. This has some general information um, and links to the RFP documents. Um, we have a link to the actual RFP um, here. If you need to pull it from here, you can, if you click on this link, it will pull up the PDF for that. Um, we do have the conflict of interest disclosure form here. It is a fillable form, so if you're able to fill it out, complete it, save it, you will be attaching that form in this attachment section down here. Um, there also is the requirement for the unemployment insurance account consent form as well. It's also a fillable form, so you'll be able to download it here, complete it, and then save it in the attachment section 
down below. Navigation to each form will be um, on this lower um, bar, bar at the very bottom, so you can navigate that way, or you can navigate on the left hand side to click through each of the forms below. So as I noted before, um, you will see these boxes um, of what is required for you to complete in order to submit the application, um, and that will be empty. And once you've completed that section, it will have a check mark available. So in the next form is the pre-application outreach, um, which has been required in the past. It's just a little bit different format where we're asking you to include the name of the provider that you did outreach to, and then their outreach response. And then we have um, an attachment section at the bottom where we are asking you to attach those email correspondences um, so we can verify um, the outreach that was conducted. Um, there is some nice functionality in the system where when you see this plus symbol, it allows you to add additional rows. So as you are adding providers that you've done outreach to, you can add additional rows and complete the information. Similarly down here, if you aren't able to save all the correspondence in one file, you can attach additional files as needed. If you ever need to delete a row, you just hit the minus button and then confirm that you'd actually want to delete that. So I do want to point out some of um, what will happen in the system if something is required. You'll see this pop up window occur if you move away from a form that has requirements in it. And then you'll see this exclamation point of missing required fields. If I navigate back to that form, to look at the required fields. There's this attention window that will then spell out exactly what is required. So in this instance, since I have three rows of providers, it's saying that they're each required and then the outreach response for those is required as well. So if you click on this, it will take you to that field too, which is nice. So if you're ever questioning like exactly which which thing is required that you're missing, you can actually click on these and it will navigate to that field. We are asking for um, applicant information with the all the um, contacts related to the project and for the proposal. Um, and then you will just go through, read the text that's around each of the questions um, and then provide um, either your responses on the text box or the appropriate attachment in the um, attachments sections that are provided. And as I mentioned, if there's anything missing that's a required field, it will ask you to complete those. So as you work through, you should be getting check boxes across all of them. Um, we do have an application signature page at the bottom, and I'll also show you the budget page as well before I end this demo. But um, this application signature page is important for the organization representative to complete. Only they have um, the ability to complete this section. Um, by clicking the boxes, you're just saying that you're attesting to the text that is um, provided in each of these statements. And then you will be able to type in your name. Once you hit save and submit, um, the date, in time and your job title will pre-populate and just pull through the system. So that will just be applied once you hit this button here. Um, I do want to note that applications aren't, you don't have the capability to submit them until November 20th. So you will get an error message on the save and submit button if you try to um, submit it prior to that date. And I did want to cover the budget section as well. Um, so the instructions for the budget um, are all at the top. And um, as I pointed out earlier, there is this ability to add additional rows. So all the um, sample budget categories are noted at the top here. Um, you can use those sample budget categories and apply them to the budget category description here. Um, and then provide any grant ask amount that you're asking for 
any match that you might have associated with the specific area um, of the budget category and then select your match type of either cash or in kind. And then add additional rows as needed. There are a few different um, validations in this section um, and they vary a little bit between the um, validations for the lower density program and then also for this program. Um, the match percentage needs to be 50% of your total ask or higher for the border to border and for the lower density it needs to be 75% or higher. Um, we are asking for the applicant match as well. Um, the total match that you provide up here in the section one will pull through into this applicant partner match um, down below in this row, so you won't need to enter that in. But if you are also providing a match on behalf of your organization or company, you can type that in here. The funding partner um, or that you have um, for the matches will need to be completed in the section three. Um, we are asking for the funding organization name, the total match amount that that funding partner is providing, um, date of funds committed, and whether or not they're federal funds. And similarly to all the other sections that have the plus symbol, you'll be able to add multiple funding organizations, um, funding partners as needed um, in additional rows here. Budget details um, to be completed in this text box here. And then a description of um, policies or procedures for vendor selection on this project. Um, and then attachments that are needed are all at the bottom here. So attachments typically you will find if they're general to the form will be at the bottom of the form and you'll be able to have multiple attachments here. I do also want to note that um, in each of the attachment sections, ex with the exception of the RFP information section, um, there is some information about how we want you to name your attachments so we can easily identify them. So please, please be aware of the file name information above um, the attachment sections just so you're aware of what will need to be completed. Let's, what I wanted to cover today. I don't know if there's any questions. I'm happy to answer anything um, that may come up for you. I'm not seeing any questions specifically to the grants management system, but I am going to put um, the email for technical assistance in the chat. Um, it's the gms.deed at state.mn.us. And then also I'll put the link to the system itself so you can start your registrations as well. Typically we respond in an hour um, to any technical assistance questions during business hours. So we're very timely in getting back to you if you do need assistance and we're happy to call you or email whatever works best for you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Santa, and we will be compiling FAQs from the questions submitted. Um, if we're seeing a number of questions related to the, the grants management system, we can include those in the FAQ. Otherwise, I think they're separate programmatically, so we wouldn't necessarily have a lot of questions about the grants management system in the FAQ. Um, so you can play around with it or go into it after you get your registration approved and um, submit questions directly to the grants management and then if we need to we'll we'll put a section on the FAQs for our program. All right um, with that we'll turn back to the intro to the Office of Broadband Development just briefly and then we'll get into um, the meat of round nine. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the Office of Broadband Development, we are a small uh, division within the Department of Employment and Economic Development, and the office was formally created in statute in 2013, and the charge and the purpose are on this slide. Um, I want to commend the legislature for having the foresight to create the office and address the need for everyone to have broadband service back in 2013, which was seven years before the pandemic. And um, actually, this is our 10th anniversary this year.
So this slide lists the roles and the responsibilities of the office. Again, I'm not going to read through it, but basically if it involves broadband and how it can help with economic development or um, help get folks connected, whether that's through mapping or technical assistance, um, administering the grant program, leading policy discussions, um, being a clearinghouse for state and federal program resources and supporting the um, governor's task force on broadband, then our office is involved. And in 2014, the legislature um, created the Border to Border Broadband Development Grant Program, and they recognize that there are areas of the state where uh, Providers just can't make the business case to go into and provision service. And so the program was created to provide financial support up to 50% of the cost of, of infrastructure to build out that middle mile and last mile broadband infrastructure um, to get folks connected. And some of the examples of allowable costs are for project planning, for permitting, um, to purchase or construct the facilities, um, to buy the fiber and the um, splicing equipment and to test the equipment. Um, so if it's an infrastructure related cost, it's generally an eligible cost under the grant program, but you can check with our grant administrators beforehand if you need to. And then um, this slide shows all of the projects that our office has awarded through the eight rounds that have been conducted and that started in 2014. Our last round awarded was in June of 2023. Um, the last two rounds had federal funding from the American Rescue Plan Act Capital Projects Fund. Um, prior to that, it was state funded each year the legislature would determine and we were fortunate enough in minnesota to have surplus budget revenues um, and broadband is a good one-time use for surplus funding so the first six rounds were solely funded with state funding and then we had two rounds that were combined federal and state funding and again i want to acknowledge the legislature for recognizing that while we're getting federal funding through the broadband equity access and deployment program, there is a gap of a couple years and they they are providing us with $50 million this fiscal year and next fiscal year to run two state grant funded rounds. So it'll be purely state funding and we have the legislature to thank for that. And next I'm gonna turn it over to Jen Frost to talk about specifically about grant round nine. So thanks, Jen. Thanks, Diane. Um, as Diane noted, uh, we do have state funds this round. 50 million will be available, 30 million in the border to border, which can fund up to the 50% of eligible total project costs, um, and then 20 million for low density, which can fund up to 75% of those eligible costs. New this year, there is a cap of 10 million per grant award for both programs. Uh, previously, border to border was only 5 million. Um, so that is new. Um, both programs will be awarded in a single competitive round. Uh, the technology must deliver at least 120 megabits down and or 100 megabits down and 20 up and be scalable to at least 100 over 100. Um, the grant awards will be geographically dispersed and all invoice work must complete by June 30th. Um, as it, for the timing of this, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, the goal is to have the, the timing of the contracts and the construction deadline. So there's two full construction seasons for this round. And then who is eligible to apply? I think we saw this in Anna's presentation right at the beginning when you got into the grants management system. Um, this is straight from legislation. Uh, a majority of the applicants tend to be ISPs and they partner with communities, but we just wanted to um, demonstrate that the intent is not to exclude any entity that's well positioned uh, to help solve the broadband connectivity problem. So, all right. And our infrastructure grant timeline, October 9th, 
our grant information system opened. Today is October 11th and we are on the grant webinar. So here you are right now. October 26th is a very important date. That's the last day to notify existing providers of your intent to file a project area. Um, this is required in statute. It's the pre-application outreach and notification. So if you complete this on October 26th, that means that you can submit your application on December 7th, which is the last day. November 20th, that's when the grant submission window will open. So if you've already notified, um, done your outreach on day one, you'll be able to submit on November 20th. December 7th is the deadline. And you'll note we have a new time. Typically, we ask that um, submissions get in by 4 p.m. This round, we're asking that they get in by 1.30. So make sure you note that time change and get it in prior to 1.30, Thursday, December 7th. On December 12th, the challenge process will open. Um, and that's when our team will start reviewing applications. We're going to review each application um, to meet minimum criteria. All applications that meet that criteria will be moved over for scoring. We'll score the qualifying applications um, against all the other qualifying applications in that applicant pool. And um, then it will be based on scoring criteria, which uh, Carrie will cover in a little bit. We hope that process takes about eight to 10 weeks. And then the goal would be following the challenge to do announcement of awards probably mid to late February. And then we'd immediately start contracting. And again, um, projects should end about two and a half years later, June 30th, 2026. So the preliminary criteria for all applications, this is that basic criteria. The application must demonstrate that contact was oops, um the contact was made the outreach you have to document that you sent emails and any response that you received and as anna demonstrated that section in the grants management system is it owns its own section you just upload um, your evidence and summarize your contact you have to document that the application serves on un and underserved locations this is going to be done with a map and a location data sheet that will provide the application must offer broadband at or above the state speed goals of 120. You must demonstrate that it's um, scalable and that has to be documented by an engineer. That's going to be required in the application. Um, the funding match has to be documented. You must show evidence of it. You can't just say you have a match. You need to show us that you do have the match. And then of course the application must be submitted on time. And so the application content overview, this is going to feel pretty similar if you've applied before. I'm going to cover it in the new layout that's in the grant management system. We also have an application guide that's under applicant resources on the website, and this will follow the same layout except provide all the, the instruction. And so Basically, the applicant information system is going to be your key data, but it's also going to be the area where you're going to tell us about your technical expertise and your experience in providing broadband service. You're also going to demonstrate that you have the capacity and the strength uh, to build, manage, and effectively operate the broadband project that you're going to be applying for. Um, this section also has a new affidavit. If you already put together your application and you based it on one of our old affidavit templates, please don't use that template. Use the new one. It has new required language in it, and that's also available out on our website under applicant resources. Um, the executive summary is pretty self-explanatory. The project area information, this is where you're going to upload your maps um, and your new location data sheet. We have a template for that out on the website. This is also where if you're proposing to serve serve in a tribal area, you're going to need to do a new legally binding agreement that shows that you have support of the tribe. A letter of support will no longer work. It needs to be a legally binding agreement. 
And I do want to, there was a question on, on the map, so I do want to note that on our interactive map, we do have a new eligibility layer map that's out there. Um, on our applicant resources, we have a demo of, of you, probably the last round, I think using that eligibility layer to be able to um, determine if an area is on or underserved. We can do a new tutorial of that, but yes, there should be um, that layer that can be downloaded. And then the interactive map, you can select the 2023 eligibility layer and go ahead and upload your own project area to the map or just draw your project area on the map to be able to see that the locations you're proposing to serve are un or underserved. Um, other sections are the broadband improvements and broadband infrastructure type. And um, those are gonna be where you document the technology type you're proposing, the highest speeds that you'll offer, um, your drop plan, whether you're gonna connect everyone or only those that subscribe. And it'll also where you identify whether you're gonna do a last mile, middle mile, or, or both um, project. Okay. Then for project readiness, this is where you're gonna upload your comprehensive engineering design and diagrams. Uh, you'll also discuss uh, your permitting needs that you'll have, your plan for satisfying environmental requirements. You'll roll that timeline over into your project schedule and you'll do start to finish your entire project and all the steps uh, that you'll accomplish in your project in a project template schedule right um, in the system. It's really nice. You get to just add a row for each item that you're gonna do. And then uh, the pro forma and ROI, you'll also talk about the need um, for for the grant funds that you're asking for. And we do have a pro forma template out on that applicant resources page that you can use. Pricing and affordability. Um, this is pretty straightforward. You're gonna identify the prices that you're gonna offer uh, standalone, and you can also show us the bundled. Uh, you will need to participate in the ACP program, the Affordable Connectivity Program, and we ask that you provide your link to the website on how people can find information about your offering of that program. For economic development and community impact, this is now where you're gonna be uploading your community support information. So that can be letters of support, it can be um, surveys, it can be pretty much all sorts of things, um, but you'll wanna upload those there. And this is also the section that just helps us uh, identify that critical need and, and the impact that it's gonna make to the community if we fund your project. Broadband assistance is where you'll put any adoption and technical training that you'll provide to the community members or subscribers to your service. The budget, Anna went over that earlier today. We also created an Excel worksheet as a resource where you can um, prepare your budget ahead of time and then just enter the information into the system if you wanna double check and have your own hard copy of that. The applicant signature, again, that is new. And I, uh, <laughs> Anna went over that. Um, so I think that that works well. Um, and then the low density section, Anna didn't show that one yet, but that section, if you go into the low density opportunity, there are two questions there. Um, one is where you'll upload a detailed fiber route uh, route map of, of your project area. And the other is you're explaining that need and why you need additional funding over the regular 50-50. Um, describe the area, if it's the lower density population, and you're just helping us understand why this is critical and makes the project feasible. And I think, I think I'm passing you over to Carrie for the next slide. Thanks, Jen. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the challenge process. Um, the challenge process is mandated by law and it includes specific provisions. Um, upon the close of the application period, on December 7th and no later than the end of the day on December 12th, which is three business days 
after the grant applications are due. The Office of Broadband Development will post to its website and we'll also do an announcement of that posting made via email to our email blast. Um, we'll have a list of the applicants that have filed for the grant program, the project name, the description written, and then also that application map layer in our interactive map, and the broadband speeds that will be offered for each proposed project. Once posted, um, existing broadband providers can review the project areas and determine whether they believe an area's eligibility for the grant program should be challenged because they either already provide wireline broadband service within any of the project areas or commit to complete construction within 18 months of the grant award being announced, which under our timeline for grant, for grant round nine would be August of 2025. Existing providers will have 30 days, which will be until January 11th of 2024 by 4 p.m. to file any challenges in writing with the Office of Broadband Development. A separate challenge must be filed for each project that's being challenged. Um, the challenge process and the required forms, including the new location data template, will be located on our website under the Applicant Resource tab. We will handle each challenge on an individual basis to determine if it's a credible challenge. The requirement that a potential applicant reach out to existing broadband providers, that pre-application reach out, that outreach that Jen talked about, um, in their project area at least six weeks before submitting a grant application should help assure that good communication happens before the process hopefully even gets to this point. Um, if a credible challenge is submitted for an application, DEED cannot grant an award to that application. So broadband providers should be serious if they're submitting a challenge, because if a project is denied because of a credible challenge, and then the challenging provider does not provision the broadband service in the project area, as it indicated it would do in its challenge, DEED can, de can deny funding to the challenging broadband provider for the following two grant rounds unless D determines that the provider's failure to meet its commitment was due to factors beyond the provider's control. Okay, scoring criteria. Um, D by law must publish the scoring criteria used to evaluate the grant applications at least 30 days before the application window opens, which is November 20th at the earliest. The scoring criteria is posted on OBD's website um, we have that under the 2023 application process tab. And it's also the same scoring criteria as the previous grant round eight, which has been posted since December of 2022. The border to border applications are eligible for a maximum reviewer score of 120 points and the lower population density or the low density are eligible for a maximum reviewer score of 140 points. Um, only unserved and underserved areas are eligible for the grant. So do not include within your grant application areas that have service or are served at 100 megabits per second download or 20, 20 megabits per second upload. So let's just discuss each category. Um, the anticipated broadband improvement points will be assigned for unserved and underserved projects. We'll be looking at the amount of increase in broadband speeds and the number of passings potentially served in those areas as a result of the grant project. For the grant funding request points, applicant matching funds of 55% or more will result in a higher score. Note, um, this is only applicable to the border to border grant applications and not the low density ones. The critical need and the, and the community participation points will be assigned for the proposed project as applicants might, must identify why there's a critical need as it relates to access, affordability, reliability and or consistency, um, community partners, tribal support, and evidence of community support will be will also be included in the scoring process, which Jenna had talked about previously. The project readiness points will be assigned based on the applicant providing evidence of being fully prepared to build, to implement, and to operate the project. The project plan and timeline will be an important scoring criteria. The demonstrated technical expertise and the organizational strength, along with financial and project plans submitted with the application, will be scored as indicators of the project sustainability. 
and that's will include things such as your organizational charts, your history, uh, resumes of management team and things of that nature. Points for demonstrating community partnership and economic development potential and benefit are also included in the scoring process. Descriptions of such impact and how you intend to measure that will be noted and evaluated in reviewing and scoring of the applications. The broadband adoption assistance, including technical support offered, broadband adoption activities and affordable and low income assistance programs, and at a minimum that FCC affordable connectivity program, will be scored and points will be awarded to applicants that include a program to encourage and or assist with broadband adoption. So the following three scoring criteria only pertain to the low density program. The passings per mile will be evaluated and given a score of up to 10 points. So for example, a passing per mile of zero to one would be equivalent to 10 points and five passings per mile and over would receive zero points. And that's just kind of in between the points are assigned. The applicant will need to demonstrate and explain the need for the grant to cover 75% of the eligible costs. Factors that the applicant may want to consider addressing include higher costs associated with, associated with construction in the project area, costs per passing, the demand for service from homes and businesses in the project area that will guarantee like a high, ta a high take rate, and why this project should be funded over other applications submitted to the low density program. Um, the new application areas, so the OBD staff will review prior grant submissions and will award five points if an application for this area has not been submitted previously, as that's an indication that the, the previous cap of 50% of eligible costs and $5 million per project had not had been a barrier to a provider in con considering an application for that area. And now I will turn it over to Mike Wimmer. Thanks, Carrie. So what stage should your application preparation be at now? So for starters, you should be working to finalize the locations or areas you intend to include in an application. Alongside that, you should be working to identify and email your communications to existing broadband providers by the deadline referenced to earlier in this presentation. You should be working to confirm project partners. One thing to keep in mind if you're looking to partner with a community is their meeting schedule. If it's a local unit of government, be it a township board, city council, or county board. You should be working to complete the project design timeline and budget, and if applicable, this would include the cost and time for environmental reviews, railroad crossings, and prevailing wage implications, obtain financial commitments and verifications for the match, and continue to gather and document community support. And if you're unfamiliar with an area or it's a new area you're looking to apply to and have questions around that community support, uh, one tip would be to reach out to you, the community or economic development professional at a county or city level or in, at a regional level. Next slide. So the next slide just highlights that we have maps showing the unserved and underserved areas that are available. This data is uh, as of November 2022. And below you'll see the state statutory broadband goals. So we had 198,000 households without access to the 2022 goal of 25-3 and 291,000 without access to the 2026 goal of 100 down by 20 up. Next slide. So this slide just highlights some of the resources that are available to you. All this information is available on our website or has links to it on our website. Um, and you, you can see we have information on the grants, uh, information and resources, the interactive eligibility map, the grants management system itself, and we always encourage uh, individuals or providers to subscribe to our newsletter and a link to do that is found on our website as well. With that, I will turn it back over to Diane. Thanks, Mike. Um, I want to thank you all for your interest in the program. We are here to answer your questions and listen to your input. Um, so if we have questions at this point, and I see there are a couple in the chat that I can go over while maybe you think of other questions. The first question in the chat was, 
To determine eligibility, would you like us to analyze the FCC broadband availability data, the BSLs from the fabric, or has DEED released updated eligibility layers similar to previous rounds? And if you go to our interactive map link, there is a layer on there to determine preliminary eligibility for the grant program. Um, keep in mind that this is a state funded grant round. So some of the locations that are not eligible per the FCC data because there is a, a licensed fixed wireless provider there offering service, that does not apply. The state requirements for state funding are that you don't have a wired broadband service of at least 25 megabits per second download and three upload then you're unserved and those applications are prioritized. And if you don't have a wired broadband service of 100 megabits per second download and 20 megabits upload, then you're underserved and also eligible for state grant funding. So um, you can do a combination, but keep in mind that that, that wireless um, does not apply to state grant funding. And then we have another question, what qualifies as a legal binding agreement with tribal governments? And there, if you go into the bead notice of funding opportunity, and that's one of the reasons we're making this a little bit stricter showing because we do not want to award a state grant funded program where there isn't that um, contract in place so that those areas then are still eligible for bead funding. And uh, it's in footnote 52 in the bead NOFO on page 37, and there it describes what is needed. Um, it's an enforceable commitment for the deployment of qualifying broadband, which would include a legally binding agreement, which includes a tribal government resolution between the tribal government of the tribal lands encompassing that location or its authorized agent, and a service provider offering qualified broadband service to that location. Um, and if you need more clarification, uh, let us know, and we may need to go back to uh, the NTIA to see if they can provide that um, for going forward. Um, I think who can submit the completed application? Is it only the organization's representative? And I think. Yeah, I can answer that verbally okay. too. I, I put the answer in the chat, um, but yes, okay. in the system, there is a limitation of who can submit the application in the system. And for those that you joined uh, the webinar a little bit later um, that may have missed this in my demonstration, um, we are asking the organization representative, which is someone who has contract signing authority with the state of Minnesota within your organization or company. Typically, this person would be a CEO or a CFO, someone that has that authority within your organization organization that's determined by your organization is the person that will need to fill out that final form in the application, which is called the application signature form. Um, others that attempt to fill out that form will get an error message. They won't be able to complete it. Um, so just be aware that um, final, final submission of the form um, has to be done by that person and also um, registration for the system itself also needs to be that person so the initial registration that occurs um, when you log into the system to register um, will need to be that person as well and they will be able to add additional members themselves once they get approved in the system thanks anna and this is diane and i see jen um, put the language in and that is from footnote 52 of the bead nofo regarding the tribal land question. All right, well, well, we'll wait a few minutes to see if anyone has any questions they want to put into the chat. Um, OK, I'm seeing one. Does DEED have plans to fast track an environmental report view with Minnesota SHPO for these grant awarded projects, otherwise due to seasonal constraints for 
environmental review processes, construction windows shrink to one or one and a half seasons. Uh, we are aware of issues with um, the SHPO review process, and we are engaged in conversations um, with representatives from that organization. Um, we're also trying to get clarity regarding the, the requirements and the difference between the funding source for programs. Um, we know that there were requirements for the American Rescue Plan Act capital projects funds that um, went out to projects last December and this June, and that some of those projects have been slowed down by that review. Um, there are differing environmental reviews for state funded projects, and then we are waiting for clarification on the bead. And I, the funding source is complicating um, the execution, I think, of those reviews, but we we have opened a dialogue with SHPO and uh, working to address the issue so that we all have a common understanding of what the requirements are based on the funding sources and that those expectations um, are relayed to the broadband grant applicants and providers so that the costs and times, if if they increase, can be built into the application process. I We know nobody likes surprises in terms of um, greater expenses or delays in the schedule, especially since you're trying to coordinate um, a multitude of contractors and subcontractors to get the job done. So. We are in that discussion and we are trying to get clarity going forward so everybody's on the same page, if nothing else, um, even if we can't shorten up some of the timelines. Well, while we're waiting to see if there are any more questions that come into the chat, I do want to remind you that at any time you can always submit questions as you dive deeper into this material to the deed.broadband at state.mn.us email box that we have um, available for the broadband grant program. And then if it's a grants management system question, that is at gms.deed at state.mn.us. I just checked our email box. We did have a question come in. I don't know if it's from someone on the call, but it's where you can find broadband providers in your local in your area where you're thinking of submitting a grant to do that pre-application notification. We do have a list of broadband providers by county on the website, so you can start there um, and make sure you look at the technology used so that you specifically target that pre-app. Um, notification to the wired providers, whether that is uh, cable, fiber, DSL. Um, and if you need help getting contact information for any of those companies, you can contact us at deed.broadband at state.mn.us and we can get you that list. I think there is a list of the larger providers in the application material as well. Well, this is Diane Wells. Um, again, I'm not seeing any more questions coming into the chat. Um, please, if you have questions as you go through the materials, submit them to d.broadband at state.mn.us for broadband program questions and for grants management system questions, submit those to gms.deed at state.mn.us. We will roll up questions into an FAQ um, that we will post to the broadband 
uh, website for round nine where the other resource materials are located. Uh, we will also be posting a copy of this webinar um, to the website. Um, we want to thank you for your attendance. Thank you for your interest in the grant program. We're looking forward to this round and getting more people um, in Minnesota connected to broadband. So thank you very much.